Well, thanks for uh, having me on here, Matt. Uh, this, is, this has been a good experience, kind of stretches me on the technology side, but it's always fun to share about, uh, about our, our farm and, uh, and what's going on. And so this is a picture of a farm here, just an aerial view, um, just a small farm in central Minnesota, Dassel, Minnesota. So we're about uh, just about an hour straight west of Minneapolis. And um, uh, it gives you kind of an idea of a little bit of our topography too, some smaller fields, uh, some rolling hills, uh, some lakes and um, rivers here in the background you might see too. So um, uh, that, that's kind of an overview of our farm. If you wanna go around the next slide there. Yeah, and the farm history, um, this is, first of all, it's a picture of my dad and I back in the early 70s. Um, my folks purchased this farm in uh, 1959, and my dad was a dairy farmer here as well as crop farmers. And that's a picture of my dad and I here. I occasionally bring lunch out to him uh, in the barn, so it's kind of a fun picture to look back at. Um, we've been certified organic since 1995. Um, right when my wife and I took over the farm, my mom had passed away. And um, so we started purchasing the farm from my dad on a contract for deed basis. And um, we were looking into organics at that time. A friend of ours had introduced us to that and it looked like a good alternative. I remember the conventional corn prices being about $1.30 at that time at the, at the local elevator. And um, I think organics were all of uh, twice that, you know, at, at about 260, 250, somewhere in that range. So it, it looked like a good alternative at that time just to um, continue growing on a smaller basis, but uh, getting the premiums there, putting a little more labor uh, into it, but uh, gaining some premiums. Uh, currently we're growing corn, soybeans, wheat, and alfalfa. Um, and we run about 300 acres, all certified organic. And we also have a small cow calf herd, which is not certified organic, but we do raise those uh, uh, as kind of as organic, uh, no hormones, no, um, uh, no pesticides. Uh, we do feed some of our borders between our, our fields and our neighboring fields. Uh, those are fed to the, to the animals as well. And then we, uh, we sell halves and quarters uh, to families that are looking for beef. And then recently I've been doing some custom hiring on, on a neighboring uh, 200 acre farm too. So it's kind of a little background on our, um, what we're doing here and um, kind of uh, what, what, we're, uh, what we're about. Go to the next slide there. Yeah, so as I mentioned, we do uh, raise those four crops. Um, this is kind of our crop rotation. Uh, if we start out with corn, then we'd go into uh, soybeans the next year, followed by wheat. And then we will plant either uh, alfalfa or a cover crop. And uh, then we'll go back to corn. And typically we'll have the alfalfa at least one year uh, before we plow it up and go back into corn. Uh, I can go to the next slide there. And the tillage side, as Matt said, this I, I'm pretty much using conventional tillage here. Um, and so corn stalks are chopped and mold boarded in the fall. Um, chicken manure is applied to soybean stubble and chisel plowed in the fall. And then alfalfa, like I said, at least one year, uh, then is mold boarded after chicken manure is applied. And then on the tillage side, just before we plant the beans, uh, we use a field cultivator up to three times. That's kind of depends on the, on the situation, the soil conditions, the, the weed growth, uh, things like that. I, I found that it's never been more than three times though. It's, uh, it's that two to three times is pretty typical just to get those first couple flushes of weeds and uh, just get the soil warmed up and ready to get those beans in the ground. And you can go to the second, the next slide there. Yeah, for planting, this is an aerial view uh, my son took with his drone. And um, this is just this past spring, spring of, um, of 21, which uh, was very, very dry field conditions. You can see the marker is pulling up some moisture there, but um, we had some serious concerns when we were planting this past uh, spring. Uh, what, what kind of a crop we were gonna be looking at? And um, 
Uh, praise the Lord, the Lord came through. We got rains when we need it. And um, we had actually an excellent crop this year. I think some of the old timers would say, if you plant it in the dust, uh, the bins will bust. And so you're always kind of wondering that when you're doing it. But uh, this true this year, at least it held true. So in our, in our situation, we're planting on 30 inch rows and we're shooting for a planting date right around the first week in June. And that of course depends on soil conditions, um, moisture, things like that, uh, soil temperature. And then we're always shooting for about 165,000 seeds per acre. Some of that is to compensate for our rotary hoeing, um, some that we might knock out during rotary hoeing and cultivating, things like that. But um, that's kind of a general idea where we're shooting for as far as uh, seeds per acre. And let's see, you can go to the next one there. Yeah, weed control, kind of the kind of the big deal. It's uh it's easy to easy to till and easy to plant, but that's kind of when the race begins, is when uh when you get the crop in the ground and you got to start fighting with some weeds. So I think the main thing I've learned over the last few years, at least in my situation in our area, is that um the weed control actually begins with a later planting date. And I've really found that to be true over the last few years. Uh, just getting those soybeans into some warm soil and getting them to grow quickly out of the ground. We, we might be um, sometimes up to a month behind our uh, conventional neighbors here in planting our beans. And it's always a little bit nerve wracking seeing them going out there and and having things finished up and probably the planter is put away in the shed and then we'll start thinking about planting beans. But uh, it's come true more than, more than not that, that, um, that late planting really seems to help with, uh, with, with good weed control. And um, like I said, the beans come out of the ground quick, probably three to four days um, and we'll be seeing, we'll be able to row them. And, um, hopefully being able to, uh, to cultivate them a little bit earlier then too. So we'd start off with, uh, with rotary hoeing and typically two times during the, during the summer, during the spring, uh, usually no more than that. The first time I usually shoot for um, about three days after planting. Uh, and that's a little bit, can be a little bit tricky. Sometimes the beans are in the hook stage and you wanna be concerned or a little bit careful about that, that, um, that you're not breaking off those uh, the stems that are coming out of the ground, but you know there's uh, there's there's never a perfect time to do it. But um, there's always rain coming, or you're either before rain or after rain. I found also too that um, even if you do go in there with a rotary hoe, when the beans are in the hook stage, um, you're probably going to kill a few more than normal. But um, it's probably still better than. Um, having a big flush of weeds coming, being able to control that first flush. And then the uh, second rotary hoe uh, pass is um, typically done in that six to seven day time after planting. Again, kind of relating to weather and uh, when all that puts together, but um, that's a pretty typical, pretty typical scenario for our soybeans. Um, well, for uh, row crop cultivating, we typically do that two times as well, usually no more than two times. Um, the first time is I like to get out there when it's at a, um, you're going to comfortable speed. Um, I, I don't mind cultivating, but I don't like going one and two miles an hour. And so if I can, if I can put it off about as long as possible, I, I try to do that uh, just to get a comfortable speed to try and get some work done and not, uh, not fall asleep at the wheel there. Um, and then the second time uh, I'd go through would be when the beans are ready to be hilled up. I can increase my speed on the tractor and hopefully throw some, um, throw some dirt around the base of those stems to uh, kill anything that, um, any kind of weeds that are coming up right around the soybean row. And then we typically do some hand weeding, some, uh, some soybean walking. We hire some kids, local kids, um, somewhere in the range between 10 and 12 kids. Um, and we'll try and walk all of our acres of beans, about 80 acres of beans, usually every year. Sometimes it doesn't all get done, but um, 
Uh, but we try and get through it and get some of those uh, nasty weeds, the cockleburs, uh, some of the ragweed, things like that, if they come through. Um, at this point, hopefully that the hand weeding is not a rescue. You're not going out there to, um, to rescue this crop because uh, we've tried to do that in the past and it just, um, it just doesn't work. It's, it's overwhelming uh, for the kids and for the farmer as well. And so we've tried to avoid that. Hopefully most of the weeding is done um, by the late planting and, um, and also with the rotary hoeing and the, and the cultivating. So hopefully that hand weeding is a little bit more cosmetic. We're certainly trying to get any, any kind of weed seeds that might escape. Um, but uh, yeah, hopefully it's more cosmetic than anything. So, and on to the next. Next slide. Oh, Greg, we had a couple of questions that came in um, yeah. uh, about how your uh, soybean group maturity compares to some of your conventional neighbors. Like, would you have a good sense of that about or how much you're scaling back in terms of maturity? Yeah. Yep. So we've we've been growing a 1.5 uh, the last quite a few years, and um, for me, that's that might be kind of the the outer scale of the of the maturity. Um, I know some other organic farmers in the area are maybe going to a 1.8, maybe at the most. But uh, with this later planting date, um, we feel pretty confident that the 1.5s are gonna do well, um, even into June. And you're not gonna get into some frost trouble, you know, into um, end of September, early October. So that's kind of our biggest concern is um, planting late, but then not, um, not running into some frost problems. So I'm, yeah, I'm real comfortable with the 1.5s. Just a little uh, plug for Albert Lee Seed. Uh, the, the 1544s have been real good for us. Um, they're the aphid tolerance and um, they've been yielding really well. I think this year they ran between uh, 45 and 50 up in our area here on a real dry year. And uh, so we're, we're pretty happy with that. Great, yeah, I mean, Craig is, uh, for those not in the know, Craig is our uh, seed producer um for us and yeah really happy that that worked out so well and definitely value that relationship um what um a couple of questions about uh what kind of cultivator you use and if there's any adjustments you make between the first and second pass of the cultivation you know either different um configurations or if you have a whole different setup between first and second pass yeah, so it's a, it's a John Deere 845 uh, cultivator. Uh, it's an eight row, 30 inch, um, pretty standard. It's got rolling shields on it. Uh, we use the C shank on there. So it's got three C shanks as opposed to the Danish tine. Um, I think the Danish tine works well in certain conditions, but um, the C shank really gets in there and, uh, and digs the soil up. And I've been real happy with that. We've got some pretty wide sweeps on it. I believe they're, um, they're probably 10 inch on the front, the front two C shanks. Um, and I, I cut the inner, the inner wings off so they can go closer to the roll. And I'm probably at a right around an eight inch, eight inch gap there, about the width of the, um, of the rolling shield. And then our, our third C shank is in the very back. And I think that's a 14 inch, that's a 14 inch sweep on it, which works well, especially for hilling. Um, if you increase your speed, it really flows off that that back, those back wings, and goes right into the uh, the soybean roll. So. Great. And there's one more question about uh, yield ceilings on food grade versus feed grade. Um, this might be kind of a more thousand foot level question. Um, and then, is it possible to hit sixty bushel of the acre with? you know, 1.5 maturity soybeans, I can answer that, that yes, it is possible to reach those types of yield ceilings. But again, you know, like I mentioned at the, the very first presentation, you know, we're, we're rarely scratching the yield ceiling of some of these soybeans, even though they come from elite genetics and, you know, can compete with Roundup Ready to extend type soybeans. You know, the, the biggest thing with organic soybeans, at least that I found is that, the, you know, it, it boils down to to management and, and weather and, and all those considerations too. But uh, there is kind mm -hmm. of like uh, big differences between food and feed grade types, but there's different 
classes of food grade beans too. So it's kind of a tricky question to untangle just in one statement. Because there's there's definitely food grade mm -hmm. clear hylum soybeans that can yield right along with feed grade beans, but they do, you know they may not meet that super high protein type contract. So it it's kind of a complicated question. Hopefully that that answers that uh, person's question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we, we have grown um, uh, food grade in the past. Um, we back when the, the aphids were really bad, um, back in the early 2000s, uh, we really struggled and we had some years, you know, 15 and 20 bushel yields. And then uh, when the aphid tolerance came out, we just naturally went towards those because all the trouble we had had. And uh, the 1.5s, the 1544s are a, um, typically a food grade, or I'm sorry, a feed grade with the dark hilum. Um, although I have had interest recently uh, in a food grade uh, from a buyer on those beans. And so um, we'll have to get together on a sample and see if that's something that would meet their qualifications. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, I felt anyway, and we've had, we've had bean yields here up to, probably up to about 55 bushel uh, on some of the best yields we've ever had. And so it, it, it always felt like maybe the, the yield per acre compensated for the, um, uh, for the premium per acre on the, uh, on the food grades, so. Yeah, I guess that's, that's probably the background on, on the weed control there. Um, we can hit the next slide then kind of the final slide here. For harvest and storage, um, we, um, I didn't have a lot to add for that. We're just, you know, we're careful to try and get those beans in at a good moisture. I used to kind of sit around and wait, you'd go out and try beans, you know, right after noon and they'd be, there'd be 14, five and 15. And um, so you'd wait a couple hours and you get into October, especially late October. And you just, you kind of start to lose those opportunities to get out and get the beans if you get a wet fall or something like that. And so in the past I haven't um, haven't been afraid to to actually put them in the drying bin uh, and either put some air on them or um, there's been actually a couple times when I put a little bit of heat on them too. Really never more than about 50 degrees somewhere in that range. It's kind of a slow dry and they really have to be babysat uh, with heat on them because they can be um, you know, 14, 15 and a percent at one point and you check them again and they're down to 11 and a half or 12. They, for some reason, they lose moisture real quick after a certain point, at least. That's been my, my experience with them. But um, it, it's kind of the same thing with wheat. We used, we used to always just hit, try and hit that perfect moisture level. But um, if, if you have an ability to get some air on them, um, I, I haven't been afraid to do that in the past. Um, and so that's, that's been a good thing too. I think you can kind of keep, keep harvesting when, um, uh, when you should be out there rather than trying to, trying to micromanage each, uh, each half point of moisture and things like that, so. Craig, wait, another couple questions. Is that, is your John Deere uh, rear mounted? Your cultivator? Yes, yep, yeah, it's a rear mount uh, 845 uh, John Deere cultivator. Okay. And mm -hmm. then a uh, question about tillage too. Um, um, so do you, um, do you always kind of fall, fall plow your, your corn stalks just as kind of a matter of course, or what, what happens if that, if it's too wet to do that in the fall? Yeah, that's a good question. It, it does come up. Um, it's never, a, never a perfect plan, but um, ideally it would be fall plowed. Uh, we have, we have spring plowed. Uh, you end up with, um, especially our kind of soil, and it depends on which field we're in, but um, you would end up with uh, potential of more lumps and things like that, just a harder, uh, more difficult um, uh, seed bed uh, to try and prepare in the spring. Uh, typically, it would, would dry out quicker in the spring like that, and you'd really have to, um, really have to be on top of it to make sure that, that that's not the case. So. And is that moldboard or chisel plug? Yeah, we've we've uh, we've moldboarded in the spring too. 
um, ideally moldboard in the fall. Yep. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems seems like that's part of the weed control uh, process too. Is is mold boarding in the fall? We've had definitely better luck with weed control uh, in fall mold, mold boarded corn stalks. So. Yeah, I guess um, that's that's about all I've got. It's a it's a fairly straightforward um, presentation, and maybe maybe more typical than not on the um, raising beans. But uh, it's it's a system that I found works pretty good, at least for my farm here. Our, um, our soil, I, I think if I, would, if I would chisel plow stocks in the fall, I think that's a possibility. I think I would end up with definitely more residue, of course. And my concern would be um, harboring some of those, um, maybe some of the problems or the diseases that you'd get with uh, a lot of corn stalks still on the surface, uh, maybe coming up into, um, uh, coming up into the beans uh, the following year. So. We've had very little problems with um, any kinds of white mold or anything like that. So, mm -hmm. you ever uh, tine weed, or do you own a tine weeder? I I do have one. Um, I, I haven't used it very much at all. It's a it's a little bit of a new thing to me, um, and so I sometimes you you have these January ideas, and then when it comes down to June, <laughs> it's kind of grab something and go. And so I, I typically just lean toward the things that I've that I'm familiar with, and um, you know, there's a rain rain coming. Do I do I try out the tine weeder or do I do I go with the rotary hoe? And I I, I should be a little more venturesome, but uh, typically it's uh, it's just time to do something, and and you got to go with it. So yeah, makes sense. Um, well, great. Appreciate all the questions, folks, and. Um... Thank you, Craig, for giving us a little overview of your farm and your production system. Um, so going to start up here and get um, our next uh, presenter, John Jovog, um, up and running here. Um, so just one moment. Can you hear us, John? Hello, can you hear me? Yep, we got you. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, if you if it's up to you, if you want to share your screen and drive, you can. Otherwise, I can yeah. uh, advance for you. It's whatever you prefer. I think it's. Let's see if that works. Can you see that? Yep, got it. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, I guess what I'm going to talk about a little bit is our soybeans roller crimping. We've been. Uh, I did my first year of roller crimping about. Well, this this year was my fourth year, so kind of uh, certainly no expert, but we've been giving it a try. So um, uh, I guess I'll just real. This is just a couple of pictures in the background of, of the roller crimping and kind of what we do. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about our rotations, some equipment that I had to kind of upgrade to or get to. Uh, the roller crimping, kind of how I how I've been doing it, and uh, some advantages and challenges uh, to that. Um, first of all, I, I use about two rotations typically, uh, but they do change from time to time as conditions uh, dictate because sometimes I have to do things differently. And so one rotation that we use because we also have cattle, pigs, and sheep is uh, I'll do some oats or small grain and then I underseed that with some hay pasture mix and we might rotationally graze the cattle or the sheep on there or use it for hay uh, depending on what's going on and then roll back into corn after four years on year four. And, um, and then we've tried some interseeding because some cover crops in the corn and hope, hoping to get a little bit. More. And then the other rotation that I'm doing on a lot uh, more of the farm, I would say is that rotation B, where we do year one, we'll do like an oats or an oats field peas, uh, might even try a very short variety soybean, a person could do uh, canning crops or things like that. But I've, when I've reached out, I haven't done, pulled the trigger on any canning crops or anything. And then I go to seed my rye cover crop. And the reason why I have a, a shorter season or a shorter crop there is I've got to get the rye in by, by September. Then the year two, we roller crimp soybeans. Then year three, uh, I'll, what I did this, this now that I'm getting into is after the soybeans, after I harvest those soybeans, I'll go out and seed down winter rye. Uh, you could do wheat or triticale too, I suppose, but 
then I'm going to uh, harvest the following year that rye for, for um, feed. And then after I harvest that rye, I'll put down a heavy nitrogen fixing cover crop uh, on there, something that I can let sit there till it freezes. Once it freezes, we're just getting into cattle. So I'm, I'm wanting to use that after it freezes to, to graze the cattle on too, but trying to fix them. Get enough nitrogen, not enough, but at least some nitrogen for the following year of corn. And then after the corn, then we'll go back into the year one rotation. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, then additional equipment that's needed. There's a variety of things. You can see in the picture here, that's actually a neighbor of mine, Ryan Wong, and he's got a, a weed zapper. And this year was the first year I ever um, tried that, or he, he came over and zapped some ground and it worked quite well in the beans. But, but um, uh, it was very nice to have a neighbor who, <laughs> who had that, that we were able to work together on that. And, um, but some other things that I've needed to, to kind of get were a grain drill to plant the rye in the fall, roller crimper. Uh, of course, those can be, um, you don't have to be that fancy. I know people can do a lot of different things with uh, crimping the rye. The main purpose of the crimp of the rye is to every six, eight inches or so to kind of snap that stem in order to, to uh, kill that rye plant. And, and you have to do it at the right time um, to, to be successful, but I'll talk to Jason in a minute on that. And then um, a no-till planter to get the beans in. You gotta have heavy down pressure springs or extra weight or something because you're actually cutting through a lot more than a standard no-till drill wood. Um, then, you know, also use bean walkers or, or the zapper this year. I've, I've done both in the past. And then, which I don't have yet, but something if, because I don't do 30 inch rows with my beans, but uh, I've heard of people who use a high residue cultivator if need be, depending on the year, if you end up with a weed problem, you can try to go in there and, and hit it with a high residue cultivator. Um, also, but I have not done that yet. So here's a little how and when, um, you know, you have to plan your crop rotation around the roller crimping of beans because you have to get that rye in by September 15th, approximately as close as you can to that date. And um, um, because the goal of getting it in that early by September 15th is, the, is so that you can get enough biomass that next year that you can crimp down and actually have good weed suppression. If you plant too late, if you plant it in October, you know, October 10th, 15th, you know, the rye will grow and it'll come around and the next year you'll have rye there, but you won't have as thick of a stand or as thick of a mat to roll down and you'll end up with a lot more weed pressure. And um, so then some, there's different varieties you can, you can try. I think most varieties will work, but, um, and I've tried, I've used a rustic uh, a number of years. Um, I did a VNS once and, um, and then I was gonna, I'm was gonna try some Spooner next year to see how that works because there's different varieties, but the Aroostic and some of these, you, you wanna get them so that they flower, the earlier variety flowering so you can get the beans in as soon as possible. So the other thing that's kind of crucial when you're planting that rye in the fall is, to make sure you got a, the nutrient needs of that rye are met because that that rye is your weed control for the next year. So you kind of have to make sure you kind of um, meet what that rye needs. And so whether you're you're using working down a cover crop or, or putting a little little bit of manure, you don't want to get too much manure, but you might need a little bit out there to um, just to make sure there's enough nutrition. It depends on what the previous crop was before the rye. If you're harvesting a field pea, you'll be fine. You'll have plenty of nitrogen and everything there. If you're, you're doing oats, if you had corn, then oats, and then you're going with rye, you might need something because you've had a lot of um, grasses in a row there. So it's, it's, it depends on how you want to do it. Um, and I've done all three of those. <laughs> so, um, and then, like I said, I try to plant the rye by September 15th. We put about three bushel to the acre uh, of rye down, um, maybe even a touch more. And uh, one key thing is to make a good seed bed when you plant that rye in the first, in the middle of September. You want the field as smooth as you can because you're not going to do anything with that field, or I don't sometimes for up to two years after that. I won't work that field if I no till in the fall crop after those beans. So I'm not doing any tillage and you, you, 
when you go to roll or crimp, you want to have that seed bed in pretty good shape so that when you crimp, you get a good crimp and the field is smooth. One year I was not as focused on that. And when I was crimping, I about jarred my teeth out bouncing around on that field. And I thought, yep, that's a good lesson to learn. <laughs> one opportunity to make the seed bed good to so do it right and um and you want to make sure you can kind of get down into some moisture um when you're planting that i who was it last year year and a half ago um when i planted some rye i actually sunk it deeper i was a little nervous but I, it was pretty dry and i sunk it down deeper with my drill and uh hit them but to get to the moisture and it came up you know even when we were Oh, we were pushing two inches down for that rye and I was a little nervous about that, but it came up just fine. So you want to make sure to get the moisture because you want that rye to get to germinate and get ready. And so because the goal is to try to get about eight ton, and that can vary a little bit of that biomass per acre when you crimp that rye so that you have that nice thick mat in order to crimp the plant. So um you know, the we plant how I've done it with I, I plant in a 15 inch rows with a no till drill and I put about 225,000 seeds per acre down. And, um, you know, there's a couple ways people do that. Some people I know plant a couple two to three weeks prior to the Ryan thesis. I have never done that. I have been a little nervous to try to meet that timing right. So then I'll typically plant and crimp at the same pass. I have the crimper on the front of the tractor and the planter on the back, and I just go out there and drive across the field one time in this crimp. Now, the one year when I did it, you can see you can see in the picture on the left there, the uh, that's rye and anthesis. Those are all the pollen, little little pollen uh, kind of falling off the side. And sometimes, actually, we had it. You can go out there and look if it's kind of breezy, and you can just it looks like just a big. Uh, smoke kind of going across the field while it's all that pollen blowing across on that rye when it's getting when it's ready to be crimped. Although you can see on the right, all that anthesis and that pollen does get on your tractor, and I had to blow out the uh, radiator uh, a couple of times that year to try to clean it out a little bit. The tractor is starting to get a little warm, but you can actually wait a little longer and crimp. And you won't have that problem of all that pollen if you wait a little longer, but you don't want to ever crimp if the seeds become viable. Then you'll end up with a quite the lawn. So you, you there's a but you get about a 10-day window for crimping, probably, to where you can kind of get out there and crimp, crimp that down. And uh, typically it, it hits anthesis around Memorial Day, the first week of June. So we plant typically we're planting anywhere from June 3rd to June 7th. You know, kind of in that time frame. So then when we're done planting, you just monitor for weeds. Um, and, you know, every year is different in terms of how much weed pressure you'll get. Uh, I've, I've kind of had the whole mix. And this last year when we planted, um, it didn't rain for about, we planted the rye and it didn't rain for about two and a half weeks after, after the beans. It didn't rain for about two and a half weeks after we planted the beans. Those beans came up really slow. It was kind of a, I was pretty nervous about it, um, but uh, it ended up working out okay, but we did have more weed pressure this year than we had in the last couple of years. Because I think the rye, it was, it was we didn't get a lot of rain and that rye wasn't as thick as what I would like. And um, it, it just didn't, it worked okay but it wasn't as good as some years. But then uh, my neighbor Ryan came with a zapper and went through, we had some weeds coming through and that really cleaned up where he went. It really did help quite a bit. So that was really nice to have that option. Um, yeah, and then you just come back and harvest. So, so our weed control is that rye. So you kind of really have to focus on making sure that that rye is, is good, healthy and, and, and in good shape and get it kind of hit that right. So, um, so I guess uh, some advantages of roller crimping that, that we looked at and why I, I started doing that is about our first year of organic was 2014. In 20, I think 2015, I tried some organic soybeans and cultivated them and did all of that. And the beans turned out okay, but boy, did I have weeds in there. And I didn't, it was, it was a challenge for me. And of course I was new at organic and everything then too, but um, 
but I, I thought to myself at that point, I was like, well, I don't know if I want to grow beans again. Well, a couple of years later, I saw some videos online and went to some conferences and stuff and talked about this roller crimping along with how it impacts soil health and all these other kinds of stuff. And it really perked my interest again. So now I've been doing that for the last four, four years and been very overall happy with it. And um, I mean, nothing's perfect, but it's, it's really happy with it. But the reasons I think is soil health, you know, it adds a lot of organic matter. If you're getting that eight ton organic matter on the top of the ground, you're getting all of that or more in the soil of those, um, of the root mass that's in there. It retains a lot of moisture. I had a, a, a moisture sensor in the ground because we do have one center pivot irrigator on the moisture sensor. And um, two, in 20, 2020, I think I, I was driving, I was hauling some, some pigs in and coming back and all these irrigators were running. What in the world? And I called the guy who put the sensor in and I talked to him about it. Our sensor was not needing moisture at the time. And I thought, well, man, he said, oh, you must, must be a faulty sensor because everybody needs moisture right now. So you should just turn your irrigator on. And I said, well, you know, let's check on this because that was on the mulch beans. And um, he came back and he actually pulled the sensor out and put a different, a new one in with a new, new monitor and everything. And it still said it was okay. We made it another 10 days before it called for moisture. And that was, that's kind of a big deal on some years, you know, you, if you can get another 10 days before you need that moisture, you know, you can really, that can, that can be a huge difference at the end of the year. Now this last year, 2021 season, um, you know, you might get 10 days, but we did not get, uh, we, we didn't get uh, a month and a half. It doesn't give you that much because we were, we were pretty dry here. Um, but it also helps that mulch will help keep that soil temperature a little cooler on those hot days so that temperature doesn't get quite as hot. It's a little less weather dependent than, um, than other things because even going out and crimping, you're driving on that thick mat and you, you, know, you don't have to worry as much about the, the compaction if it's, you know, if the things, it just, it just seemed to work. You, you kind of had a bigger, wider window. Hopefully you don't have to cultivate, um, usually less weed pressure. Um, you do have a lot of residue when you're done harvesting. There's a, there's, there's a lot of uh, soil armor, I guess you could say, on there. And, um, and I'm actually looking at, at doing more roller crimping of other crops. We did try some roller crimping and then transplanting in some winter squash and things like that that we can do. We're, I'm interested possibly next year in trying a small field of, of roller crimping corn. I know the Rodale Institute has done that. And that's kind of interesting. Um, I'm going to, I might try a small field. I like to do trials on very small fields that are right next to the road so everybody can see them. But uh, no, that's kind of a joke. But um, it's, that's where I end up doing them, unfortunately. And I joke with the neighbors, if you see me bailing my cornfield or hay field in, the, in August, you know, it didn't work. But if it looks like a nice cornfield, my, my uh, experiment works. So it's kind of a trial. Uh, so, and then other advantages of having that cover crop on the ground. This is just a photo that was taken a couple of years ago now. Um, you know, on the same day that's just a mile apart, that water weight kind of moves through and you can kind of see the difference from when you have the rye grass in the in the field versus when it's just a bare field in terms of the, the penetration of water into the soil, uh, holding that soil and, and, and building that soil. So it's... Um, I, I just really like the, the system as a whole. It, it fits with what we do at our place. So, um, you know, every, everybody has different advantages and disadvantages, but um, it's just a great overall system. So, uh, and then that 2020 growing season, you can see here, if you look at the beans, you can see the rye mat underneath the beans and uh, that's still there, but it's a pretty clean field. And 2020, I would say, was the perfect conditions for, for roller crimping. It was fantastic. 2021 worked okay, but not as good as 2020. And it just happened to be that in 2019 and 2020, the Mauer County Soil and Water Conservation District, Steve Lawler, he uh, came out and, and they did kind of this little video drone footage kind of throughout the whole year um, for 12, for a 12-month 
system and put together a little three minute video. And I thought I might quick show that and Steve Lawler actually talks in it. And, and it just kind of shows the whole thing from beginning to end of, uh, of that. So if I can make this work. Uh, we'll just do that here. I hope this works. If not, somebody better interrupt me. So can, can that be heard? Uh, we can see the video. Um, can you hear it? Uh, kind of hard to say if there's supposed to be sound, not having seen it before. Oh, there is sound right now. But if you can't hear it, maybe I'll just uh, maybe I'll just just talk get through it real quick. Yeah, and what this you can do, John, is um, if you uh, we can drop the link in the chat too. So if people, oh, okay, uh, yeah, then people can, yeah, that would be fine. Uh, but this is this is the the it's about ninety acre or about hundred acres of rye. This was planted. This is what it looked like in uh, I think it was like early early October, and uh, uh, just kind of um, so it was just kind of a quick aerial view of that rye. But it looks real nice here in uh, in October, and it's part of this is to try to get uh, weed suppression even coming on through that. So. This now again is early spring or I guess April of 2020. So it came out of dormancy here in, in uh, a couple of weeks. So it started growing right away. We haven't been, done anything in that field. There were a few little winter kill spots you can see uh, scattered around, but they actually started to come through and it didn't impact much, much weed pressure. I did run around there and uh, with just a whirly gig on the back of my tractor and I planted a little rye seed down on those bare spots. And here in June, we were planting on June 5th. This is just a little aerial video of uh, the rye. You know, it's about five feet tall probably. And it's just, you can see it blowing in the wind. There's kind of a pretty cool view. But um, then we we went through and you can see where we're roller crimping. I'm planting the, uh, the beans in there and I crimp it the exact opposite direction of the way I plant the rye so that I don't you can see the rows of rye going the opposite direction of what I what I crimp. So um, and I have a, a drill, a 30 foot drill with uh, six inch on center seeding. So this is just going out and you can see the crimping when you hit it at the right time. This was crimped a little bit later, so I didn't have all the pollen issues that I had the year before this. But um, and you can just see all that thick biomass. It's down on the ground. That's my weed control. That'll help mulch and keep the weeds out. And it's killing that rye as I'm doing it with that heavy crimp. This is in August, that same field. <clears throat> you can see where my lines are from when I planted. That's what those are there. Is that, you know, I, I don't have GPS on my tractor and with that heavy crimper in the front. Um, but it was really a clean field. Here we're harvesting it. We averaged on this field, the whole field, about 58 bushel beans, which we were ecstatic about. And um, uh, it was a very clean, clean field. We did have, um, I called a, a bean walking crew in and uh, they walked this whole bean field in um, about six hours. It was 11 guys that came out. They spent six hours in this field and did, and, and walked it. And so that was my total wean control for the, for the year. So that was a success. That was a success that year, but but um, uh, so my weed control that year was just I just crimped it, had those bean walkers in for about six hours that one day, and um, and then combine, and so that was about a, the perfect conditions I would say for roller crimping, but not every year is perfect. Let me tell you <laughs> that uh, uh, you know some some successes I say farming organically will always keep you humble. Um, so this year, 2021, you can see on the picture on the right, we had a lot of late season grass that came in, uh, woolly cup and, and uh, foxtail, giant foxtail. Uh, we had some ragweed in there. Um, you can see it, it was in patches. It wasn't over the whole field, but we had patches of heavy grass that came in late. And uh, the, you know, sorry, and then we had the zapper come, uh, Ryan, neighbor came with that zapper and took out all the tall, tall weeds and that worked really well with that, but it was a little harder getting that grass to, 
to, to out of there. And so, you know, our yield was, you know, we were about 40 bushel beans this year on the, on the roller crimp ride. So it was substantially different than a year prior. And it, but it was it was such a dry year, and those beans grew. They were so short this year. Same variety of bean both years, and those beans were so short this year. They were good. There were spots that they were only foot and a half tall, two two feet. Some places they were maybe two and a half, but they weren't very tall, and they just didn't grow fast to canopy and to do what you really wanted them to do. So it was more of a challenge. But we 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 went. Most of the summer without much rain. We we bookended the summer. We had five inches of rain at the beginning of the summer, and uh, before I planted the beans, and then we got about eleven or twelve inches of rain in a week right at the end of the summer, but uh, not much in between. So, you know, it is what it is. But and then on the left, the other thing that came in. This is the rye that I planted this fall, and we had army worms for the first time. I'd never had this happen. They came in and took out about half of my rye. So you can see they turned the field black. So next year, unfortunately, I'm not going to be roller crimping much. I'm going to have to go and do the, the cultivating and uh, pine weeding, cultivating all of that system because, you know, it, um, I'm not going to have a rye stand that's going to be there. It's going to be thick enough. But, hey, John, um, we had a question come through. Um, sure. When you have uh, crews walking through, are they pulling weeds or cutting them down to the ground? Um, they, the last few years, they just cut them. They didn't pull them. They just used, they had a little, little uh, machete. Type thing. They just cut them. And that works pretty good on, that worked really well on, uh, uh, you know, everything when they came and did that. So, so um, but, the uh, so the you know, but it doesn't work like I said, it doesn't work perfect every year. Um, you know, the, we have a little later planting dates we plant it, you know, in, in June, a ways you're not getting anything in. You got to wait for that anthesis of the rye to make sure that when you crimp it, you're killing it because you don't want that coming back. And um, but if you do it right, it, it works really well. And then, um, uh, one advantage I said was a lot of residue after harvest. But that can also be a disadvantage if you're trying to till that up and, and do something like that. Like that. So it depends on your system and your rotation <clears throat> and what you do in terms of whether um, uh, whether that residue is a good or bad thing. But I tend to, to like residue. But <clears throat> so let's see. And so that's why you always need kind of backup plans, I feel like. Nothing works every year. This is another, after that last photo of where the army worms got here, it's just another photo of that. You could see those army worms, if you were looking at it, they were every, I mean, they're just all <clears throat> throughout about two thirds of the field. So then, you know, some alternative possibilities is if you plant that rye and it doesn't grow, it doesn't work, then you can do the, the regular till or uh, system. Um, you know, if you, if you let the rye go and it, it, um, it doesn't maybe isn't quite thick enough. You can always just harvest the rye and sell that potentially, um, you know, or you go with a different crop. You know, there's a lot of options, but you always have to be willing to, you can't stay, you, you gotta be willing to make a change once in a while, even on the fly. <laughs> so, like this year we have to, I guess. So, um, so those rotations that I said earlier are kind of our, ballpark, but it, it might change. Conditions may force you to do one. So, and resources, some places that I've relied on a lot for, for help on this because is um, you know, the organic conferences, you know, the Minnesota Organic Conference, O'Grain, Moses. Um, I, I, the first I heard of this was actually through that Aaron Silva from the University of Wisconsin. That's the first I ever heard of this roller crimping on rye. And I think it might've even been on YouTube video. I'm not sure where I have seen it again. But, uh, I pretty much followed what they recommend and it's worked really well as long as you get the rye stand. And so um, Albert Lee Seed House, of course, you know, I mean, when you're talking about different varieties, different things, they, they have a lot of people there who have a lot of experience in doing that. Uh, you know, our soil and water conservation district, 
land stewardship project. They have a soil health team, Rodale Institute, and of course, other farmers. Just talking to other people who are doing this. I mean, that's you can learn a lot from other people. <laughs> so, so there's a lot of uh, a lot of different options. So I guess that's just kind of the quick Cliff Notes version of it. Um, so thank you. I guess if there's any questions, feel free. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, John. Really appreciate the all the photos and and uh, the detail about the system. This is uh, especially the video is really really cool to see. Uh, kind of a five hundred foot view of of what's happening on the farm. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, when it when it works, it works. Uh, but definitely, I think you've laid out really well the potential um, things to be aware of too, and potential pitfalls. I, there was a question about another winter rye variety called ND Gardner that was developed from uh, North Dakota State uh, specifically for the system. And we've, we've now grown and sold that variety, I think for the last two years now, specifically for that roll down system. Um, have heard good feedback from folks. I, I guess I can't speak to the fact of which rye variety is necessarily better than another, uh, but definitely from an agronomic standpoint, ND Gardner um, has a heck of a lot more yield to it and probably um, has a little bit thicker stems than uh, standard aroostook. Also a little bit, a little bit newer of a, a genetics as well. I have not tried that one, but uh, you know, I'm always open to trying different, different things because the main thing you want to have is that, uh, you know, the aroostook, the one thing, reason why I kind of moved a little bit away from that, and I was going to try some spooner and some other stuff was for that uh, aroostook was a little thinner stemmed. And yeah, it would be nice to have a thicker stem because we're looking more for biomass more than anything. Yeah, and we've definitely definitely heard that feedback from other folks too with a rustic that it um, it it has thinner stems, so it doesn't quite do the shading if you have a little bit of a, a lesser stand than that three bushel the acre, and that you also get. Um, or certain folks have experienced issues with it sprouting after it's um, rolled down too. I've definitely come across that. Um, I've had a little of that. Over, um, actually, the first time I hauled some beans down to, uh, there's a crush plant down by uh, Riceville. I took it there and then I brought the next load the next day. And they ran it through a cleaner and they had two five gallon buckets of rye seed that they cleaned out of the beans and they hadn't seen that before. Yeah, you can get a little of it, but it wasn't, it's never been much of an issue. And a little rye in there doesn't bother me much because that hasn't seen the first yield. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, important to note too that if, you, if you're if you using rye as part of your rotation, this is whether you're doing the roll down system or not, but pretty high likelihood that you're going to have rye there uh, in your rotation, you know, coming up in other crops too, just, uh, as, a, just as a standard um, awareness principle too. Um, great. So thanks so much, John. Uh, we're going to get uh, transfer things over to um, Eric Madsen uh, from Iowa and talking to us a little bit about um, ridge till uh, soybean production. So looks like we see your presentation here, Eric. Can so, you hear me, Matt? Yeah, I can hear you. So you're good great. to go. Okay, thanks, Matt. Uh, my name is Eric Madsen. Uh, my farm in West Central Iowa. Um, farm alongside my dad, Vic. Um, I believe he started organic around the year 2000, so he's been at it quite a while. I came back around 2007-ish, I believe, and uh, started farming some acres of my own organically in 2016. So um, I'm going to kind of focus my quick presentation today about the ridge till soybeans. Um, we've tried different methods of uh, soybean production and kind of settled back on ridge till. Um, and we'll discuss that a little bit today because a lot of you probably have never seen it or heard of it. So um, quickly, our rotation has kind of based off of Dick Thompson's work that he did in the late 80s, early 90s, which is corn, soybeans, corn, oats, and alfalfa. And I guess the, the kind of the kicker of the ro whole rotation thing is um, be flexible, be willing to open. Um, we play a little bit with winter wheat. And, you know, if the year you have a field that gives you a problem, uh, maybe leave it in alfalfa for another year or two. 
or do a extra, throw an extra small grain year like winter wheat in there um, to kind of break up the weed cycles. Uh, challenges to organic soybean production. Uh, number one, what I'd say was weeds. Um, just that is the, as Matt has mentioned many times to the overall uh, number one contributing factor to soybean yields is weeds. Um, your goal obviously is a picture on the left. The goal on the, the kind of the more common reality sometimes is the picture on the right. So how do you aim for the picture on the left? Uh, fertility, seed genetics, which I think hopefully with what we've heard this morning and things that they're getting better and we're learning more of what uh, genetics and what plant types work well for organic soybean production. Um, equipment needs, time can be a big thing. A lot of these soybeans, at least with a conventional till soybean system, you're maybe running over that field five to seven times per year. And it just, the, the time and the month of June just can really become crucial. And lastly, yields kind of is the final um, aspect of how do we get um, respectable yields in the organic system. Uh, why do we ridge till? Um, I guess I kind of jokingly say because my dad Vic won't give it up, but there's some reasons that he won't give it up. Um, this is a scientific report done um, looking at 20 factors affecting soybean yield. And the number one of 20 factors is planting date. And with ridge till, you'll see here in a minute, um, we, we allows us to plant earlier and thus hopefully get better yields. Um, this is a PFI trial that Ron Roseman conducted several times. Um, this most recent one was in 2007, where he looked at planting date and uh, versus tillage system and did weed counts and yield. And it was amazing that the early ridge till planting not only yielded the best, but also had significantly less yields than the conventional till later planted trial. Um, he also did trials, the same trial in the late 80s and early 90s, and it consistently showed five to 11 times more weeds in the conventional till versus the ridge till system. Um, I'll run quick through how the ridge till system works. We build ridges in the previous corn crop. We'll then chop the stalks in the early spring. Uh, we really try to plant into a warm, dry forecast if possible. We'll rotary hoe it two to three times, cultivate as soon as reasonably possible when that bean, soybeans are four to six inches tall, ideally. Um, then we'll cultivate one, maybe two more times, and we'll walk for problem weeds. We've kind of started walking basically every year now just to keep things clean and hopefully stay ahead of the weed seed bank. Uh, building ridges, this is done at second cultivation in the corn, corn year, the preceding the soybeans. Um, we primarily just use buffalo equipment. Um, you, the ridging wings are the kind of the, in the top right picture, you can see it's just a flat kind of V that sits right behind the sweep and it hills up the corn. Um, sometimes we also will turn the cutaway discs around so that instead of pulling out they are throwing up towards into the row. That's kind of a picture showing the ridge that we create at second pass cultivation that will then plant the soybeans into. Um, picture here, chopping stalks. Um, try to do this a couple of days, a day or two as early as possible, really before planting. Um, it clips the corn stalks from the previous year. And if you have any spring annual weeds, um, kind of gets them mowed off and sets them back a little bit. Um, we're using a rotary mower here. Um, a flail shredder will work better. A um, couple guys I know that do this system use like an MC rotary sai. That also works well. Um, sometimes you can skip that mowing pass, but uh, things work better, it seems like, for us if we do get it mowed. So here's a picture of actually ridge till planting. Um, we do it with a buffalo kind of specialized planter set up for ridge till. Um, you can see the goal is to clean off the old corn stalk row residue and throw all that residue and any weed seeds laying on top of the surface into the row middles. It shaves off that top, oh, two to three inches kind of depends 
on how big your weeds are that are established. You got to make sure you get cut underneath those established weeds. So you're shaving off two to three inches of soil off that ridge, shoving it into the middle, and then planting into that clean strip, hopefully. And you can kind of see on the picture to the right where all the residue is shoved to the middle of the middle of the rows. And then Eric, what are you using for row spacing? Yep, good question. We're on 36 inch wide rows. Um, we tried 30s 20 years ago, actually went back to 36s. We found it just gives us more room to let residue flow and we can effectively cultivate a bigger percentage of the field with the wider rows because you have less of the strips where you can't cultivate. Um, and lastly, in our terrain, we have some rolling hills that tractors on wide rows are just more stable and it gives you a little more room when cultivating a curve to kind of to lead the cultivator around on side hills and things. Gotcha. Thanks for that. Um, like here's a closer up picture of the planting with the clean ridges on the right, the where we hadn't planted obviously in the left. Um, kind of the the key to the whole buffalo system versus just planting early with a conventional planter is that the only firming on a buffalo planter is done by a one inch press wheel. You do not have a three inch wide gauge wheel running on each side of the row pressing down. Uh, like you would in a conventional John Deere or um, Kinsey planter per se. So you're only pressing a one inch wide um, pass right on top of that seed. And therefore you're, the rest of that kind of strip is nice mellow soil um, that hopefully is, it gives weeds a little bit harder time to get germinated. I like to plant thick, um, probably overdo it maybe, than what's really needed. Um, we kind of shoot for 180,000, give or take. Uh, we get really aggressive with the rotary hoe, so I'm not, I'd rather err on, on the side of too thick than too thin. And the time frame, um, the last few years, we went to ridge tilling our soybeans before we plant corn in a May 1st time frame. Um, again, we're in West Central Iowa, the typical so organic soybeans would be delayed till June 1st time frame. So we're generally a month ahead of um, the, the typical um, conventional tilled organic soybean planting range. Uh, rotary hoeing, um, we'll rotary hoe it at least twice, sometimes maybe three times. Um, the one thing with ridge till is you kind of almost need a, a minimum till rotary hoe like a Case 181 MT or an M&W. Uh, the main difference is that those two styles of hose um, have one wheel per arm, and then the wheels can effectively uh, move up and down uh, independent of each other versus the common John Deere hoe with two wheels per rotary hoe, and, per, per arm, excuse me. And the, the John Deere style can occasionally plug up when you're trying to run in the high residue situation like with what we are. Um, the, the big debate is if you're burying or plucking out too many soybeans, I guess I personally just go, don't worry about the beans. Um, we've had times where you think you, you want to stop because you're tearing half of them out and you come back in three or four days and you can't tell any difference. So again, that's the reason I like planting thick. I'm sure we do tear some out, but um, I'm more after the weeds at this stage. Then we switch to cultivating again with buffalo equipment primarily. Um, we run mainly buffalo 4600 cultivators. They have a kind of a center stabilizer disc which cuts through the trash. Disc killers pulling away from the row on the first pass and then the single sweep pushes the loose soil back in. Um, they can handle basically any soil condition. Um, if you would have the time and uh, willing to turn a wrench, there's everything is adjustable on them. You can make them do about anything if you take the time and um, play with them and get them to, to, to work. A couple pictures of the buffalo in action. This is first pass. Um, these soybeans are a little bit big for first pass, but um, it's what we had at this time. 
you can see those disc killers, those cutaway discs we have set as tight to the row as possible, um, usually six and a half to seven inches, um, really, really tight, um, shaving some leaves typically, but it's your first, really your, your main ch last chance to get some of those weeds that are really close to the row. Couple more pictures of cultivating. We do run tunnel shields um, on that very first pass to kind of protect the soybeans. Uh, we cultivate pretty deep on that first pass. We're typically two, three, maybe even four inches deep because you've got to get undercut that mat of residue. And by this point, you may have that you've got to get underneath the roots and be sure you get them sliced off. A um, couple of cultivating aids, and this doesn't matter if you're doing ridge till or anything. Um, I absolutely love cultivation mirrors. Um, they're still made today pretty reasonable. I think they're 250 bucks. Last time I looked, bolt right on the side of the tractor. You look basically back down um, underneath the rear axle, and you can see exactly where your cultivator is running um, in relation to the row, and really is a, a, a good aid of if you're maybe un unexperienced cultivating or even if you are, it's just reassuring to be able to look down and see exactly what's going on behind you. We also run a Buffalo Scout guidance hitch. Um, it's kind of a poor man's GPS. It's basically a quick coupler with a couple hydraulic cylinders in between that can effectively steer the cultivator left or right. Um, the, Crop needs to be about 10 to 12 inches for the wands to be able to follow. Um, they, we've had enough experience with them. I guess we've had, we have real good luck with them, uh, but they can be kind of frustrating when they don't work. Uh, the downside is they are heavy and they set the cultivator back about eight to 10 inches. Um, so it just sits farther behind you and makes the cultivator lift that much harder. Second pass cultivating, um, kind of wait till the, you know, the, the crop gets mid-sized. Um, if it stays relatively clean, this may be our last pass. Again, with the buffalo, um, I like the way the cutaway discs in the left picture, you can set them to kind of sneak underneath the soybean canopy almost. And the nature of the way that cutaway disc hooks and pulls, um, if, it, if that disc grabs a weed or even a soybean, um, it, it will grab it and pull it out. Of course, if you kind of rub along the edge of it with the edge of a sweep, sometimes it can just push the weed over to the side a little bit and maybe won't tear it out completely like those disc killers will. Um, harvest, uh, really nothing too much different. Uh, sometimes we've added a, a rock guard or a, just a piece of hose on top of the soybean platform right behind the sickle to kind of help keep the dirt clods out of the head. Um, sometimes with, if it's a little bit wet or when we cultivate so deep, it can kind of bring up some clods and uh, that, that can be a simple way to keep some of that from going in the combine. Um, we kind of like to wait till the stems and weeds are dry to prevent staining, especially if you're growing food, made, food grade beans some of the buyers can be real picky on um, if you've got a lot of green or damp material running through the dust will stick to the beans and stain the seed coat. And in a last case scenario, um, you post harvest cleaning and emergency, you could run it through a rotary cleaner, et cetera, or some of the buyers at the mills will have secondary cleaners that um, if you run into a disaster, they can clean. So just a quick kind of overview of Ridge Till. Um, a few challenges, uh, special equipment needed. You kind of need uh, a, a specialized planter set up for ridge till, primarily buffalo. Uh, the buffalo did make some um, attachments that would go on like a John Deere or Kinsey style, but uh, the, the ones that I've seen work the best are just the buffalo planters. Uh, we don't have the terrain to strip till, but I think there is a possibility there maybe of making it work um, with GPS. And if you had flat ground to maybe run a strip tiller ahead and kind of do effectively the same thing as what the Buffalo planner will do. 
the problem is the Buffalo planters haven't been made for probably 30 years. So they're kind of long in the tooth if you can even find them. Um, but the, the strip till thing maybe would be a, be an answer that for guys looking to get into it. Um, another challenge is things don't always go smoothly. Um, can fight plugging. Um, if you want to just be able to go cultivate 50 acres after dinner and not get out of the cab, probably not going to happen. Um, it seems like we're always having to tweak and adjust uh, things to get that residue to flow through. Kind of that same sentence, you got to be willing to modify equipment to field conditions. Um, it seems like we're always kind of tweaking or making adjustments between fields and between, um, between passes. A little hint is what we've done is we've bought three or four or too many different cultivators, but instead of having a, one cultivator, you change everything on for each pass, uh, maybe have two or three different cultivators set up differently so that you can have one kind of set up for your first pass, maybe one for your second pass, and then maybe one for you know your final pass or your hilling pass. And that doesn't matter if you're ridge tilling or doing anything, doing conventional till corn or soybeans. Um, having different tools in the toolbox, I think, is important for different stages. And lastly, I kind of have a love-hate relationship um, with Buffalo equipment. Um, it's very crude, um, simple but crude, can be kind of a pain to work on. It's heavy, uh, but if you take the time and have the patience, you can make them do about anything. So I guess if there's any questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Eric. Uh, really appreciate the, the time and the effort that you put in um, uh, to putting this presentation together and giving everybody an overview of your, your system there. Um, sincerely appreciate that. Um, so we're uh, about at time now, but I mean, we, we've got as long as folks want um, uh, the, so we can stay on for as long as there's questions here. Um, so if you have them, um, feel free to type them into the chat and we will create a little discussion here. Um, I had a question come through about, Eric, specifically about your system uh, with cover cropping with the ridges. Is that, are those two things compatible or do you have to kind of adjust that with your rotation? Um. <laughs> We're trying to make that work unknown yet how exactly um, we've, so little backstory, we've tried interceding um, winter wheat into the corn or a cover crop preceding the soybeans, um, by which I should back that up a little bit. I like using winter wheat versus rye because it, the winter wheat doesn't get as aggressive for growth patterns in the spring and can be easier to handle if it gets away from you. Uh, as far as the winter wheat on top of the ridges, um, we've tried doing it broadcasted. It became a challenge um, with the wrong weather pattern. The wheat got ahead of us and when we could get it torn out. Um, this fall, dad's trying to, uh, we've got to set up a drill to just drill right on top of the ridge. And the goal, I guess, is to be able to shave the cover crop off with the planter and not let it grow until first, completely until first cultivation. So we'd like to do that, just still trying to figure out how to make it work together without becoming too much of a hindrance. Gotcha, thank you. Um, there's a question that came through, this is maybe more generally to anybody that feels like they wanna chime in about uh, planting soybeans after sorghum. I'm not sure if that's sorghum sedan or straight sorghum as a cover crop or if that's a uh, rotation um, crop in previous years as a, as a cover, but if anybody has any um, inroads on that, uh, feel free to, to chime in either in the chat or, um, or elsewhere. I've definitely heard of people using sorghum sedan as a cover crop um, as, you know, kind of a full season cover crop with really problematic weed fields. But obviously, um, if you don't have livestock, that's kind of a whole year out of production, potentially. Um, and don't have a lot of people, in, in, at least in our 
in the upper Midwest planting sorghum uh, as a grain crop. Um, it's more common for folks to grow corn, at least in my experience. Oh, okay, so the guy clarified, um, this was not a cover crop, it was chopped for forage twice during the summer. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if, if I would assume if it was in the previous year, you could very easily uh, follow um, a cover crop or, or a forage crop of sorghum with, with soybeans very easily. You know, as long as that residue is managed appropriately um, going into the, the production year of soybeans. <clears throat> 